Thank you very much for coming to our uh, second session for our uh, conference, our video conference series on the investment environment and agri-food research and innovation. Um, my name is Serge Bui. I'm the CEO of the Agri-Food Innovation Council. And today's session will focus on, is there an investment gap for agri-food research and innovation? Um, I wanted to thank all the participants, the, the, the speakers today, the panelists today, and uh, the attendees. Um, they will be introduced in a, few in a few seconds. Just a reminder that all attendees have been put on mute um, and that we're using today the Q&A button that is at the bottom of the, your screen. So should you have any question, please pose it and we are welcoming questions to our uh, speakers or panelists. Uh, uh, type it down in the Q&A button. It will either be read or you will ask to, to uh, say it directly and be unmuted. Um, and um, um, that's the process that we're going to be using for this conference. It worked the last time, uh, uh, last week, and hopefully it works again this week. We are uh, suggesting that you vote on the questions that you want, uh, that you see and that you want uh, most uh, to hear an answer for. Questions can be addressed to all panelists or uh, individual panelists. On all of those good notes, I'm going to pass it on to, our, to Dr. Julianne Curran, our president, uh, the chair of the board, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, president, chair of the board, uh, and uh, for the Agri-Food Innovation Council. Thank you, Julianne. Thanks, Serge, um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for participating in our session today that's organized by the Agri-Food Innovation Council. AIC is an organization that advocates on behalf of its members for agri-food research and innovation. We are focused on the development of policies and advocacy at the national level. Today, AIC is led by a board of directors from various parts of the sector. I am the VP of Market Innovation at Pulse Canada, which is the national association representing pulse growers and, and processors, and I am the chair of AIC's board of directors. Our other members of the board represent different parts of the agri-food sector and hail from most regions of Canada. Our membership of AIC includes national, provincial, and regional organizations, companies, industry associations, academic institutions, and government organizations that are all interested in policies related to agri-food research and innovation. These organizations have joined AIC to help shape, support, and accompany our efforts to support a strong Canadian presence in the field. If you have not done so, I encourage you to join AIC to participate in the discussion, help us develop sound policies, and strengthen our voice. As more focus is placed on food production, food safety and food security, there have been global efforts to increase investments in agri-food research and innovation. In Canada, this includes government, academia and the private sector. The intent in this series of video conferences is to identify how policies could support the development of a stronger investment system in our sector's research and innovation system. I would now like to recognize some of our sponsors for today's session. Egg Expert, Canadian Science Publishing, Protein Industries Canada, and MyTax. So at this time, I'd like to invite Bill Gruel, CEO of Protein Industries Canada, to say a few words in recognition of their platinum partnership. Uh, thanks, Julianne. Um, as uh, she said, my, my name is Bill Gruel. I'm the CEO of Protein Industries Canada. I'm very pleased to join you today at the second session of AIC's 2020 conference. Uh, and the session today, is there an investment gap for agri-food research and innovation, is very relevant to the work we're doing at Protein Industries Canada, not only to advance large-scale technology and innovation projects, but also to build a sustainable ingredient and processing sector. We know the agri-food sector requires a large amount of investment in both research and development, but also in capital. And we know it will need to come from a variety of sources. 
At Protein Industries Canada, we've been working with some of Canada's most innovative and ambitious companies to increase investment into Canada's innovation ecosystem. And working with these companies to date, we've committed $111 million to 17 large scale science and innovation projects over the last 18 months. And that investment has leveraged an additional $196 million from industry partners. We've engaged more than 65 members of the ecosystem, including SMEs, global leaders, Canadian anchor firms, and a strong mix of academic and research institutions. But the truth is, and the exciting part is, that we're just getting started. The momentum of Canada's plant protein sector is only matched by its opportunity. And we know that for Canada to become a global leader and preferred supplier in plant protein ingredients and products, we need to continue to work together. And one main area is increasing capital investments in our sector. At Protein Industries Canada, we've set our own goal to process an additional 20% of our annual crop production by 2035. We know that even a 20% increase in processing done here in Canada could generate an additional $12 billion of annual economic value. And that's just the conversion of raw seed to higher value ingredients and doesn't include the additional follow on processing opportunities for food processing. And we know that that will require large capital investments into the sector measured in the tens of billions of dollars. That's why today's session is so important and so timely. And uh, I would like to pass it back. And uh, I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thanks again to Protein Industries Canada for their platinum sponsorship. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Churchill, who is president and CEO at AgWest Bio, and who is also a director on the AIC board. And Karen will be today's moderator. Oh, you're on mute, Karen. Okay, better. I owe a lot of beer on that whole mute button. Um, but thank you for uh, for uh, having me moderate today's session. I'm really excited about the speakers that we have today. They're all very much experts in their field and I look forward to hearing from them. So just to give you a brief um, opening statement of who they are and before we ask them to introduce themselves in a little more detail, we have today with us Lori Dimitrician, who's the Chief of Equity Investments at PIC Investments. Uh, prior to joining PIC, Lori was the Executive Director of the Agriculture Council of Saskatchewan and has extensive board experience in both the for-profit and non-profit sectors. We also have Lynn Godlian, the CEO of Perenia Food and Agriculture. In this role, Lynn provides leadership to the company's various service lines and teams and develops the strategy and vision for the company. And we have Dave Smarden, president and CEO at BioEnterprise Corporation. So under his guidance, BioEnterprise is navigating the shifting Canadian landscape of food, agriculture, clean technologies and delivering impact through high growth scaling projects. And our final panelist is Alison Sundstrom. So Alison is the founder and CEO of Conservex, a Canadian company researching and applying blockchain technology in agriculture. Formerly alongside Grow Safe Systems, the co-CEO and co-founder, they developed the Advanced Data Analytics Machine Learning Platform that acquired data from individual animals in their environment. So thank you, welcome to our panelists. And Lori, if you care to say a few more words, um, starting with you about your experience. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, greatly appreciated, Karen. And thank you to the Agri-Food Innovation Council for uh, hosting this panel. Uh, the topic uh, you know, is something that is near and dear to my heart uh, in terms of an investment gap for agri-food research and innovation. Um, my background, as, as Karen has said, is I've been in the agriculture sector pretty much my whole entire career, which has been a very long time. Uh, I definitely have lots of gray hair. Um, but just absolutely love the space. I'm working for a family office now called PIC Investment Group. And what we do is my boss owns eight operating companies in a variety of industries, and he makes investments on a minority basis 
in 22 other companies. So part of what we're trying to do right now, agriculture and health are our priority sectors, and we're definitely looking for more new investment opportunities. So in, in terms of sort of this, I wanna make a couple comments and then I'm gonna stop because um, I'm really interested in hearing from the other panel members. Uh, tough topic, you know, I think this is a very broad question. Uh, obviously I do feel there's an investment gap or I wouldn't be here right now. Um, I think I kind of look at it a little bit more broadly in terms of, yeah, I do believe we have an investment gap for agri-food research and innovation, but we also have a lot of opportunities uh, before us. And what I'm really trying to figure out is how do we grow and scale more uh, Canadian agri-food companies. I think that's something that's definitely near and dear to our heart. So something that, you know, obviously we'll be talking about further, but uh, just as Bill had said, I think there's a real need right now for more government private um, collaboration opportunities. And I think things like the super cluster funding through Protein Industries uh, Canada is something that I think will really help our sector grow because our companies need help. There's definitely sort of that gap in the early stage area. With that, I'm gonna stop talking and pass it on. Thank you very much. Karen, you're on mute again. It was a good thing I was on mute there for that one. <laughs> Lynn, could you, would you introduce yourself please? Yes, I would love to. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation and for having me. Um, when the organizers uh, asked me to be part of this panel, I was very clear that I'm not a scientist. I'm not a food scientist. I'm not an agrologist. Um, but yet I have 20 years experience working with phenomenal people who do that uh, with our clients every day. So I do want to take this opportunity just to give a little bit of um, a background about Perennia because a number of you probably may or may not have heard about us. Um, I like to think they're a little bit unique in Canada and that we are um, a provincial government agency, but we are a for-profit corporation. We're located in Nova Scotia. We've been around in various iterations for about 20 years. And in the last three years, we've doubled our staff. So we're probably about 85 strong right now. Um, and we're really the only development agency that's in, at least in the province and the region, that's focused solely on the development of the food sector for Nova Scotia, but we do work in the rest of the region and in, um, and in Canada and the rest of Canada. So we, how do we do that? How do we work and why, why would I be even here to contribute? Um, we do, uh, the, the legacy of our company is extension, agricultural extension and working on farm with commercial farmers. Um, and we've slowly grown. So we sort of cover the whole chain now. We, we help grow, um, raise um, if you're in livestock, and then we have a food safety team. So we have a five member food safety team. And then we have a product development and beverage, food and beverage innovation center. And um, we recently <laughs> made the foray into seafood and into cannabis. So we have quite a bit of um, stuff going on under the hood. And from an investment perspective, we realized that there was a gap and a teeny tiny, sometimes it's only the tiniest little things. Like I just wanna get that across to folks that sometimes the barrier of even getting nutritional facts tables is too much for a small company just to get to the next market, just to get to. So about two years ago, we partnered with the province and the feds under a cap program and we called it the Agri-Food Accelerator Program because we really felt like there was a need um, not for not for funding that happens every year that you have to make sure that you're within the window of applying it's available all year there's a one one form that you have to fill out to be able to get funding and it really is just to get you over that barrier and it's in food safety market access and product development and food safety technical sort of dealing with recalls and things like that. So we're in our second year of that. And it's been very, very beneficial. The success stories that we've had in the five and $10,000 range, not the million dollar range, but clearly there's a, there's a gap in that as well. So I know there's always been a tension between what is the company's investment and what's a good public investment, but I do believe that there's a wonderful way for us to be able to I mean, the food business is hard, people. So it's it's wonderful if we can come together and sort of figure out how we can how we can support them. So I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks, Lynn. 
Dave, a few words about bioenterprise. Sure. Thank you. Um, and it, it's it's a real pleasure and honor to be here with uh, with this crowd. Um, a lot of expertise at the table. Um, so bioenterprise, uh, it's it's always a challenge to try and tell you what we are. It's easier to tell you what we aren't, but. Um, we're an engine. We're a commercialization engine. Used to be called an accelerator, but we don't really fit the accelerator mold. Um, we've been around since 2003. Um, we don't do cohorts. We, we cherry pick. Um, we, we assess opportunities and we cherry pick the best ones. And then we put the necessary resources around those to get them into the marketplace as quickly and efficiently as possible. So it's very much a customized effort. Um, we've worked with about 2,700 companies since 2003. We've raised about 300 million in, in equity capital. Uh, the bad news with that number is about 90% of it has come from outside of Canada. Um, and we certainly have experienced um, uh, the, the fact that it, Canada tends to punch below its weight on the international scale when you compare it with places like Ireland, the Netherlands, uh, Israel, Singapore, and others. So um, we are hoping to, to help change that by launching something called Canada's Food and Agritech Engine. We launched it in June. We had uh, over 105 interested parties in joining. Uh, and those parties are everything from colleges, universities, research institutes, all the way up to investment firms, incubators, accelerators, service companies, and multinational corporations. So the intent here is, is to bring the ecosystem in Canada together um, into a more efficient engine and thereby helping Canada punch above its weight rather than below. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Allison. Thank you, Karen. Uh, what a, an impressive panel that I've joined today. Um, I am a repeat entrepreneur, so we always think that we don't have enough funding. But uh, today I am working with a spin out from Carnegie Mellon University using machine learning to solve some of the toughest challenges facing agriculture. I'm also, as an exited entrepreneur, I got very active in uh, the investment uh, community. I'm a venture partner at Builders VC, uh, Silicon Valley venture capital firm, and uh, a fellow and founding partner of the Creative Destruction Lab. And we're accelerating massively scalable science-based companies. Very excited that tomorrow is the first day of our first ag uh, cohort. So very exciting for us. Um, I'm also an LP and investment committee member of the 51, a female-led investment fund. And we have just started our first uh, ag uh, thesis. And we have at least four super female-led um, companies that are coming out of Canadian universities. What I'm really concerned about, and I think Dave mentioned it and Lori as well, what I'm very concerned about is where we rank in the world in terms of expenditures on research and development. Since 2010, our industry R&D expenses have dropped by 24%. Our industry R&D personnel um, we've actually removed about 48% of our R&D personnel within our companies. That's serious stuff. Um, we also, and, and this one, I, I really like Slovenia as a country, but in the Bloomberg index rankings, that's the country we rank behind. So I'm not certain we all think of uh, Slovenia as an as a innovation powerhouse, and I guess if we rank behind them, then we're probably not a powerhouse ourselves. And if we consider our resource base, uh, Canada could be an agricultural superstar. So I'm very excited to join the conversation today and uh, look forward to, um, to the discussion. Thank you, Allison. I have to admit, I'm, that was, those are very impressive words to start with. We, set the stage for an interesting conversation. And the first question is kind of a, a good starting place as well. And it's that, do you think that every stage of research and innovation process has been fully funded currently? And I can ask for volunteers first, who would like to start? I'll start. 
Um, <clears throat> and again, I, 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 I'm, I'm honored to be on a panel with such esteemed colleagues. So I might bring a different, a different perspective to it. Um, I think our clients have found that there is, there is small pockets of money that are available to mitigate the risk at the beginning of the process. So we're doing a lot of work with our, with our clients. And again, it's Atlantic Canada. So we would love to have the next McCain's or the next Cavendish, but a lot of those folks have to start somewhere. Um, so we've been able to find like we're through NRC or through um, ACOA or through those types of funding avenues and even our egg accelerator, we're able to get folks from idea generation and necessarily they want to go right to prototype. So I feel like there's money there for that. It's the, it's the folks that walk in that have big dreams that want to get into Costco or want to export, but don't necessarily have the foundations of business, how to attract the investment, how to go from commercialization, even finding a co-packer, right? Like I just feel like there's a lot of resources in agriculture. We say that a lot in Nova Scotia, actually, even from our extension component and the, the, the information that we do have. Um, but I feel like getting the holistic approach and getting them across the finish line to successfully to market, that's where I think there's money at the beginning, but not necessarily to help them fully commercialize. At least that's the experience from our, our food entrepreneurs. I'll take a crack at this as well. Um, so the, uh, on, on the research side, we haven't very often had difficult, difficulty in finding research dollars for companies we work with. Um, they have trouble finding it, but there is an ecosystem out there like Perenia and others who can help uh, connect and facilitate those kinds of, uh, of research dollars. Where it becomes an issue is in the piloting demonstration and seed capital side, where the company is, um, to use a, you know, the TRL um, categories, TRL 7, 8 and up, where um, now they're looking for some real money. And um, th this comes to where, where do we find this, this, this capital to help them do pilots and demonstrations and, and get into the marketplace. Um, there are no real seed capital funds in Canada focused on ag and food. There are pockets of angel money here and there, but it's pretty, pretty insignificant. Um, and when you compare that with what's available in life sciences and ICT, uh, the whole agriculture area is really underserviced. Allison? So I would take a contrasting opinion. Um, I actually think that uh, very good companies can find money. But at the same time, I would say that perhaps we don't have the entire research and development capacity, nor do we have the commercialization capacity within our companies. And what that means is uh, the companies that understand what it takes to go to market globally, we're a very small country. If you are an entrepreneur, you've got to be a global entrepreneur. And so I see that, um, maybe the pandemic has given us an opportunity to uh, really take a viewpoint on how our companies expand. The companies that were highly resilient through the pandemic, um, those that were very agile, have seemed to be able to respond quite well. And so I think we need to look at, at what made them strong and, and how do we respond um, to set our companies up well to succeed. And I think our focus is mostly on commercialization. So I would agree with Dave in terms of the fact that we need a scale up. We need a scale up um, seed group, but I do actually think that um, industry as well as government has a role to play in this. And Laura, your experience. Yeah, and definitely I'm glad, um, yeah, I've uh, all three of you, I think your comments all make a lot of sense. Uh, I know what we've seen, I've been in agriculture for a very long time, uh, especially on the value added end, I've never seen more interest. So, you know, in my mind, that's super exciting, but we do have an issue. Um, I agree. I think if you have a good idea, I think IRAP, like there's lots of amazing sources out there that you can use. Um, I would almost argue we have a, you know, a food, we have food centers across Canada, and I would almost argue that they need more resources. 
um, because a lot of people don't really understand that that is a great uh, resource for them, but they're so busy and there's so much excitement right now too that I think there's a lot of research groups that we're, we're not funding enough. And I think we really need to kind of take a step back and look at that. Um, I, I get worried, um, you know, there's so many VC funds that we're seeing now, especially in egg and food, lots from the US. And, I, you know, as a Canadian, you know, I'm, I'm kind of biased, but I, I think, you know, how do we do that exactly what David said? How do we create more angels? How do we get, you know, some, some of that earlier stage funding done? But I've had experience with some of our companies in terms of, you know, using different research institutes kind of across Canada. And, and I think it's, it's almost a uh, research exp is expensive and you can find money for it. But again, we, there's, we have to work on that. How do we get the researchers to understand more what commercialization takes? And again, private industry needs to move quickly. And, you know, there's such a lack of resources um, with the research institutes too, that I think we have to address that too, because they're just not moving fast enough. Like we've had a couple projects that have taken forever and ended up being a lot more costly. Um, than we had anticipated. So it's just, you know, there's lots of gaps in the system that I definitely think we have to focus on. So that takes care of the stages, but would you also say that there is perhaps types of research and investments that are receiving less funding, research and innovations that are receiving less funding than others? Can I take that one, Karen? I'll start and then I'll go ahead again. Um, just with respect, I thought that was a super interesting question. Um, and I would have to say definitely, I think, you know, if you're in a hot space, like we all see that, that you know, investors and entrepreneurs, you know, it's, it's exciting. Like we look at the whole digital innovation space, there's a ton of exciting things happening. You know, there's that ability for entrepreneurs to uh, obtain funding. But if you're in the more traditional sectors, I think that's where we also have a gap. And sometimes we forget that we don't always have to be in the hot sector. You know, there's there's a feed industry, there's, you know, a meat industry. So there's, you know, we just have to have more of a holistic approach too. And it doesn't matter what sector you're in, you know, if it's if you're commercializing research and, and looking at something innovative, I think we have to really kind of take a look at that too as well. Allison? Well, I have a, I have a fairly distinct um, opinion on this because I think that we should be investing on the future. And I also think that we should be, we should have a, we're shifting from a traditional infrastructure uh, approach into a more intangible approach. In other words, um, digital technologies, we need a stronger digital infrastructure in Canada we need next generation IP strategies and we need new data policies. And if we were looking to where the future actually sits, there was a really good uh, McKinsey report that came out and most recently and said that 60% of our physical inputs into our system are now going to be biological. And what that's going to mean over the next 10 to 20 years is probably $4 trillion annually. So if we're looking at alternative proteins, alternative chemicals, alternative textiles, our traditional industries, which uh, Lori spoke about uh, very correctly, we still have to focus on our traditional uh, industries, but we also have to be positioning our traditional industries to be shifting into the future. And so I'm very excited to see that we really support genomic research, biological research, but also look at the intersection between biological and also uh, computer. If we as a nation can look at cognitive computing, physical sensing, biologicals, wow, can we ever start to look at what our future prosperity is going to look like? So I do agree, but I do think that we have to commercialize our, our inventions. We sit very low on the patent ranking uh, across the world, we sit very low on commercializing our inventions. We've got great universities that are producing, um, I think our publication history is amazing. What we produce out of our universities is amazing, but we don't tend to commercialize those inventions and those thoughts. So agreed, we've got to invest across every segment. I don't actually think we're investing enough anywhere. 
And I would say, Karen, if you don't mind, if I go next, mm -hmm. um, I would say that from our client perspective, um, innovative processing technologies, um, even if we, even if they have a chance to play with them, we don't have a lot of opportunity to invest in those um, new drying technologies um, that support export. Um, new um, different types of packaging. We've had an upsurge in people when we buy different types of equipment and packaging equipment that's a 30 or $40,000 piece of equipment. We've had a different service line where people can rent that. We had, a, we had a client that had an export market and didn't want to make the capital investment and was able to um, rent ours for very low money and they decided, okay, we can, we can pay for this. We can do this about risk mitigation. And I just feel like, you know, going back to what Lori said about the food development centers. Um, yes, we probably like everybody who walks through the door has a different, unique um, query. And if we can't help them and help them quickly enough, um, what do they do? Right? Like, I think that that ecosystem needs to be invested. We're constantly, constantly behind looking for funding to try to find new and, and um, new services that we can provide our clients or new opportunities for them to mitigate their risk by not having to put capital in and using our pilot plant and using our equipment that we currently have and different technologies. Dave, do you have some, some thoughts on this topic? Well, I really support what Allison was saying, um, almost word for word. Uh, we're lacking in funding all across the innovation value chain. Um, so there's a lot of gaps there that need to be filled. But um, a couple of comments that I wanted to make that, that I find rather frustrating. The first one is, is that I mentioned earlier that we've, we've serviced or, or been involved with 2,700 companies since 2003. Of those companies, 4% have come from our university research community, only 4%. And when we talk to the universities, and I won't name them, but there are many on universities that will say to us, our interest is not in commercializing or forming new companies. Our interest is in licensing. That's what our tech transfer office gets paid to do. And so while we do work with the tech transfer offices, it's, it's quite unusual for us to end up working on a, on a, a new startup company that is coming out of the university. Um, and you, you can probably guess the best universities in Canada where we're going to get most of the activity from. So, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a big B in my bonnet. I don't know how we, as a culture, get more, um, more commercialization going in this country and how we get people thinking about revenue generation and, and profits and those kind of things, which in some, in some, um, some communities is a dirty word, right? Do you know, we have a couple questions from the audience that kind of relate. Um, the first one from Valerio is uh, one concern is how are the organizations that represent industry connecting and funding startups with universities? So is there an innovations and capacity located but struggle to find a path to market? Is, is this connection missing in Canada? Erin, I wonder if I could take that question. I, I noted Valerio's uh, comment. Um, my former company had partnerships with um, almost every major agricultural university in North America. And it was really the way that we commercialized our product. And there is probably no slower route to market than working with universities, but there's also probably no more sound way of introducing your agricultural product in terms of being able to demonstrate field experimentation and other things. And I found myself laughing when Dave was commenting because he said his comments come out of frustration. And that is so much how I feel. If, if you're frustrated, you tend to respond and, and really uh, go to work. Our technology transfer has got to be advanced. If you're a technology, that goes broad-based. Um, if you enter a university and try to work with PIs, you can find wonderful PIs to work with. But um, my former product crossed IoT, was biology, was genomics. And I had to go through the university silos to find the folks that I could work with. Now I'd say there's many universities across, country that, uh, across the country that are improving this. But um, we've got great ideas in those universities and we have to unlock them. 
So um, I would say inspiration comes from frustration. And uh, I really do think that there's a huge opportunity to link up our researchers and our, um, and our entrepreneurs. And it's possible. It can be done. Can I comment on that too as well? Mm -hmm. um, so Allison, I love your comments. You know, it's something that, that um, you know, I, I totally agree. I think we need to figure out, like, how do we better commercialize research? If research is happening in the universities, how do we do that? And we've actually, interestingly enough, in the healthcare sector, we've got two companies that we've invested in that are direct spin-outs of universities. One is from Simon Fraser University in BC, and the other is Dalhousie. And I, I've toured the, the operation um, at Simon Fraser University and I was completely impressed. And I think um, they've kind of figured out that model for um, entrepreneurship with respect to their, the academic community too as well. They encourage it. It's not just on the side of their desk. There's, they provide um, space for the professors to further develop their technology. Um, they have grad students, like they have a whole program sort of wrapped around it. That was probably one of the best examples I've seen to date. Now, you know, again, I, I was there, it's one company, um, but I just continue to be impressed by that. And I think we need to kind of figure that one out too. Uh, on the agriculture end of things, uh, I recently tried to get a pea starch strategy going. Um, so brought all of the researchers, researchers together. And what I found out was fascinating. None of them had really ever collaborated before. We were just trying, and Karen, um, your organization had helped with that. Egg West Bio helped us and hosted that, that session. And we just brought all of the people we could think of in government, university, all of these different organizations, food center, into one room and said, what can we do? So I think we still have a gap there in terms of, of you know, the universities and the communication and collaboration at the researcher level and make sure that it's, you know, the university you know, some, there's, all, there's that public good research that needs to be done that, you, that industry doesn't need to be involved in. But, you know, how do we create more of these collaborations? I think that's the big question. Mm -hmm. And if, if I can follow up on that, what Lori said is that, and I don't mean, to, I don't want to talk about Perennia too much, but I do really feel like there are organizations like Perennia that play that role of being a bridge between either departments researchers and ground truthing them or finding connections for them in the industry because we deal with the industry all the time. Like all, like, you know, so that's kind of our secret sauce is that um, I always say to my team, the public funding that we do get to put ourselves in front of, um, in front of farmers, in front of um, food entrepreneurs, in front of food processors every day is not just so that we can help them, but it's so that we can gather intel to take back to other folks. So I'm just, I, I, I do believe that there's a missing bridge that needs to always be considered and how do you ground truth some of the stuff and we can connect people to the researchers, to those folks that can really actually work with them to be able to ground truth, whether it will work or not or what needs to be, be adjusted. Mm -hmm. And Dave, you have thoughts on how we can increase commercialization of academic research? Well, um... Well, how much time do we have and where does one begin? Um, I wanted to go back just for a second to the, the comment that was made about uh, co getting corporations engaged within the university community. And uh, just a, a quick little story. We have some pretty, a, a pretty extensive network of multinational and national companies engaged in agriculture and agri-food. Um, so we went out and we started having interviews with them to try and understand how can we better sell Canada and how can we better sell the, the ecosystem that, we, that we're a part of. And um, a couple of the comments that came back were very interesting. The first one was, look, we're a multinational. We employ 7,500 scientists. What could Canada possibly have that we haven't already seen? Um, that was a real slap across the face for us to, to hear that coming from a, a large multinational. Another, another one said to us, um, look, we used to fly technology scouts through Canada once, twice, three times a year, and they would go to all the usual you know, places, Guelph, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Calgary, and so on. Um, we don't do that anymore. Uh, we don't do that because first, we can't afford it. And, and, and second, we have to be more targeted in, in our approach. So instead of going out, just, just looking at innovation and seeing if we can't find something that's interesting, we want to go to, a, to one organization and we want to say, here are the three things we're looking for. 
Can you find them? And if you can't, do you have the expertise to produce them or to, or to resolve this issue? And we have seen a big change in how we operate and certainly how I think some others are operating rather than being pan innovation across the board. If we want to engage the multinationals and Canadian national companies, we have to be focused on what their issues are. They want to resolve certain issues that are going to make them more competitive in the marketplace. And so we have to be cognizant of those and go out and find the solutions for these things. So we have, as Allison said, we have a huge entrepreneurial community. We have a huge research community and we need to find a way to engage these communities, this ecosystem to solve some of the big problems that companies are having. So Karen, I wonder if I could just follow on what Dave said. Um, I feel like Dave and I should uh, actually go on the road together because we both have very similar ideas. Um, I became a fellow of the Creative Destruction Lab and it's an example. And there's a question, there's a question in the chat from Raj Lada, who's a, research, uh, a researcher and an inventor. So the Creative Destruction Lab came out of the University of Toronto Rotman Business School. And it's, it's set to link um, Bioenterprise and Creative Destruction Lab um, work hand in glove in many, uh, in many, in many ways. A Creative Destruction Lab has got a template that um, they will connect as an incubator and we're an accelerator that um, does not charge entrepreneurs. We have a series of mentors that have scaled their own businesses and had successful exits. But we also link um, university researchers and others to um, MBAs. We're trying to develop a host of MBA students but also to scientists within the universities. And it is a, a, a step for any researcher that's trying to, um, trying to commercialize a product. We'll look at researchers from the stage of an idea and concept. We would prefer that they have an MVP or a, a viable product, but we like to work with uh, researchers over a period of a year to help them commercialize their um, inventions. And you'll find uh, Creative Destruction Lab at five different sites in Canada. The agricultural one is very unique in that we are linked to the University of Calgary, the University of Alberta, the University of Saskatchewan Engineering and Business Faculty, as well as the Ag Faculty. And we're connecting scientists into the University of Guelph and Dalhousie. Um, I think that there's a position for us, but there's a position for other accelerators. Um, there's not one that there's not one size fits all. But I think we are starting to see that this potential can occur. And if anyone on the call would like to see what Creative Destruction Lab does, I'd be delighted to have you as our guest during one of our sessions. But there is possibility. Do you know? I think we, if we go back to our original questions, um, which are about gaps, gaps in investment, and we talked about the stages, um, perhaps being not fully funded and sectors not being fully funded. So would anyone care to comment on the gaps? Because I see we were seeing that maybe there is a gap in connecting university research. So very, very early stage to capital investments. Is there any other gaps that you see besides very early stage? Uh, Laurie, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. Okay. So that one was kind of, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's definitely gaps. Um, you know, and one of the ones I'm going to bring up, and I, uh, just because I've seen over the years, uh, and I think the gap is, I think it's getting better, but when you look at sort of the traditional food processing um, industry in general, I think it's been very hard uh, for a lot of the companies to, you know, launch their products, um, to, to get funded. Uh, but I think it, it does appear like it's getting a little bit easier. But again, I think it's, you know, it's when you look at sort of that angel, like I still think we have a gap with the angel investor in that early, you know, you got your your MVP, like Allison was talking about, you know, if you're not in Creative Destruction Lab, if you're not in some of these other accelerators, I still think it, it is very hard um, for earlier stage companies to get funded. And even at the VC level, because the VCs are always trying to de-risk 
ventures. And so if you've got a food processing company, like, you know, hopefully you'll be able to toll process, but, you know, making that, that leap from toll processing to maybe your own facility, or like, I still think there's a, there's a big gap there. And I, I think there's a lot of help that's definitely needed. And again, it's how do we get sort of the angel investment community to get more interested in some of these things that may not be as exciting too, as well. And Lynn, is that your experience as well, that there's kind of a shortage of angel investors? Yeah, and how you connect to them um, and how you prepare for them. And that's why, you know, um, the work that Dave does is so valuable in the, in, in the ag tech sector, especially. And if we could have that sort of broader and that, sorry, I have a 12 year old Boston Terrier that just came in and is quite pleased with herself. So if you hear her, that's what that's what the panting is. It's not it's not me. I just wanted to let you know. Um, so. Um, yeah, it, and you know what, we're working on the next generation of our agri-food accelerator and we have identified that getting people prepared to be able to have, um, and it's not even a good pitch, it's just like that they've got the financials, that they've done the work, that they've done the market research, that they've packaged it properly, that they understand what the investor's looking for. Um, is that, so if you have an MVP, I'm glad that you do because a lot of, a lot of dreams should be killed before they get even to any, you know, you know, there's a lot of go, no go decisions that probably aren't made, but I would completely agree that preparation of folks for investment is definitely something that will be in our next uh, phase of the accelerator program. I'm going to take a crack at, at some of this as well. Um, and I'll be very interested in, in how Allison follows up on what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, I, my experience, uh, I don't have a, a lot of time in agriculture. I, I got into this in, in 2003. So prior to that, I was in information technology and I was at Apple Computer for a, a number of years. Um, in the high tech world, we watched as entrepreneurs came through high tech. They, they, they built their businesses up, primarily funded by a lot of large corporations and by some very specific small Silicon Valley investors. And over a, over a long period of time, these angels these, these entrepreneurs exited and they went back into the community as investors. They did several startups and they, they, they built up their wealth. So you ended up with quite a large community of angels investing in information technology and software and so on. We haven't seen that in agriculture and food. I mean, there are, there are exceptions to the rule, but by and large, we just don't have the numbers. Uh, and my experience has been that angels typically invest in what they know. So if you grew up on oil and gas, you're going to be very comfortable investing in oil and gas technology. You may be less comfortable in, in investing in, in agriculture. We are seeing a change. Um, I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot more interest in ag and ag tech as it starts to permeate uh, into, into some other areas. So bringing sensor technology, robotics technology, the management of data, that tends to attract non-ag investors into the ag community. And this is great news. Um, but agriculture just seems to me to have been at a disadvantage over the years when it comes to investment. And so organizations like Perennia and, and Allison, what she does, and, and myself, we have an education, an ongoing education process to, to present the opportunities that exist within agriculture and agri-food and to show the success stories that are, that are taking place. Um, and success breeds success. So uh, we will start to see more and more ag investors coming to, to this sector. Um, I'm a little disappointed in the, uh, the number of institutional investors that have, that have come into this space. They, they kind of sit on the sidelines. A lot of the pension funds and so on that, that, used to, that we used to rely on for venture capital funds are putting their money into real estate and agricultural real estate and farms and, and ignoring the innovation side. And we need to find a way to entice them to come into this this sector as well but so you know history says that we, we've been disadvantaged but i think things are improving dramatically as we go down the down the path and allison do you have do you have the, the byline or subline for for dave's comments absolutely i'm dave's best sous chef here um i find that um i find dave's comments interesting um i come out of livestock so I've been involved in tech, but I spent uh, like over 20 years in animal agriculture. And everywhere there was oil and gas, there, were, there was cattle. And that seemed to be a global kind of perspective. So I see that investors in, um, I see that investors in energy are, are really likely sources for capital within agriculture. 
I also think that we have to get this mindset away from agriculture being my dad on his tractor. And you know that's what a lot of us think about agriculture as. And if you look at it, we're one of the oldest industries. We employ almost 50% of the world's employees. Um, agriculture is just such a wide, um, a wide base. And I'm fascinated when I see entrepreneurs who can pivot into a space like agriculture. Um, they're thinking only about them being tech, but they really are agriculture. So it's, it's um, educating investors in what agriculture is, what it can be, what the returns can be. Um, I think that we have to attract as much Silicon Valley capital as we can, or as much capital from everywhere, but we've got to make them invest in Canada. So, and, and that's very much with my venture capital company. I like being part of the global, of the global marketplace but I also want to see them, if we're going to invest in Canada, we have to um, invest in Canadian companies, help them build their company here, not necessarily just invest in a company so we can bring them across the border. So I think there's a lot of really exciting things, but I also have to think we, if we want angel investors to invest, and I'm an angel investor, as a company, I have to have the best idea. I have to have the best capacity. I gotta have the best business plan. And I've gotta understand that investors invest in me only because I'm passionate, I'm committed, and I will work on my idea. The second part of that is, is that we need to have very good government policy and um, tax credits, incentives to make angel investors want to take the risk and back to what Lori said, she said that she said the most famous word. She said, we need to de-risk so that people will invest. Yeah. Can I just add on, because I'm a big supporter of the um, angel investor tax credit. We fought for so many years with the provincial government. Like it's just, you know, we saw it in other provinces. We saw, you know, their sectors expanding. Um, and, you know, we've proven it works. Innovation Saskatchewan took a leap. Uh, they ended up putting in the tax credit in Saskatchewan, and we've seen, you know, a record number of angel investors coming to the table. So, you know, to build on what Allison is saying, I completely agree. We have to find ways to de-risk um, industry, you know, like it's, it's hard out there right now. Plus, we have a global pandemic on top of it. But the interesting thing about the global pandemic is agriculture is one of the um, less touched industries in a global pandemic. So I think, you know, right now, as I said, we've got a great opportunity here um, to sell agriculture in Canada. And I think if we don't move quickly, we're going to lose it. You know, on that attracting investment theme, I think that relates to a question we have from the, from the audience is, you think that the public sources of funding, I said, um, WD, NRC, IRAP are actually crowding out private investment in Canada. Maybe we can start with you, Allison, instead of wrapping up with you. Okay, we'll see if uh, Dave can do a good one too on this one. Actually, no, I don't think so at all. And I, I actually think that uh, government research, government investment can be collaborative. And uh, as an angel investor, I love companies that have received NRC financing or NRC support, I should say, because I know that they have been vetted in the same, in the same breath of, I also love to see um, an indus, a company that has gone through PIC, for example, has gone through the entire process because I know that they've been vetted to a degree. So I actually think that there's, it's a hand in glove situation. Can I just make a comment too? Uh, and the other thing that I, I agree, uh, I think the other, other thing that I think is so critical is the repayable loans. We've got Western diversification, we have um, ACOA uh, sort of you know, in the Maritimes and I think those programs are fantastic and we've had so many companies that have accessed them at a very difficult time and it's really kept them going. So you know, the more of that we have too as well, um, yeah, we, we say, please leverage as much as you can. It's a long path and it's an expensive path. And, you know, I think we have to recognize that, that there's help out there. Well, I, uh, totally agree with Allison and with Lori. Um, 
I think um, uh, I look upon government as a catalyst. So if there are things that government policies can do that will help drive innovation and help drive investment in that innovation, then, then I'm, all, I'm all on side for it. Um, I think the, you know, the, the venture capital community in Canada took a real hit in the, in the early 2000s. When we, first of all, we got rid of the labor sponsored funds and like them or, or not like them, they put a lot of money into the marketplace, some successfully and, and some not successfully. Um, we never really replaced them. And even with the, the tax credits that have been offered in various provinces, that doesn't really replace what we had at labor sponsored funds. And the pension funds have moved away from, from venture capital as an asset class. So we've been left with angel and angel, angel communities trying to make up the difference, reaching out to, to corporate venture and, and when, when we can. Um, I, I, would, I would like to see, uh, as they have done in the Netherlands and in Ireland as well, um, some incentive program to bring institutional investors back to the investment uh, industry in Canada. Instead of focusing on, uh, you know, um, on, on, on land in Australia and Chile and Brazil and other places, which they can still do, but I think they, sh they should be allocating a certain percentage of, of their, uh, their investment dollars back into Canada. Uh, it certainly has, has worked well in, in the Netherlands, albeit it's a much smaller community. But um, uh, and I, I look upon, as I said, and I started off here, but the government needs to be a catalyst. And I think that I think it's not just about angel investing, it's about bringing the institutions back as well. And what I'd like to add to that too is that you know we we do have a springboard or springboard Atlantic. So whether it's a launching pad or a springboard, I do believe that public investment. And I think that I also want to highlight the fact that I don't believe that there's a grants coming out this year, but the technical access centers, we have one of them in our region, which is the Canada Smartest Kitchen that's associated and affiliated with um, um, colleges um, and polytechnical institutes and they're in fisheries and agriculture and a whole host of, of areas. But, you know, there is a lot that can be there to help folks move forward. Um, and I do think that there's, it's not crowding out private investment. I, do, I will say this though, and even though I'm still learning about seafood, the amount of programs and investment that's available in agriculture versus seafood, it's a totally different, different, um, different industry. So there's a lot of programs, seafood doesn't have, uh, before the agricultural fisheries fund, they didn't necessarily have a lot of funds that would. So it's a totally different ball game. They totally different industry. Mm -hmm. So Raj also has a question about there is so many different places that a researcher can go to try and, and attract research and they have to spend a lot of time finding those pathways. And I agree. I feel like there's a new VC popping up all over Canada, left, right and center. Um, you know, record numbers, actually, some of them from the Silicon Valley. And I don't I just see more and more of them. So if you're actually an entrepreneur, where would you begin? How can you, how can you pair up the companies with the funds they need? Is there anyone offering those services? Sure, those services are offered in many, many different places. But you know what, if you're an entrepreneur, um, you get up first thing in the morning and you start the calls and uh, you look all over the world for those companies and those supporters and those sources of financing. So I think that's, that's really part of the role of an entrepreneur. Um, I think if you sit back and wait for government to fill your non-dilutive opportunities, I don't think that you're necessarily going to get there. But NRC IRAP offers an open portal, which gives you all of the information on grants that are available within their purview. If you go to several universities, uh, Western is one that has just a superb opportunity. Um, they keep up daily, uh, links to uh, grants and support, and almost every university offers this in some way. If you're a university researcher, you should get known to your technology transfer department. So really, um, once you start connecting in, being a member of a business association is also incredibly helpful, the Pulse Association and others, because they're always curating ideas. So. I think as well, going to Dave's uh, group, going to CDL, um, even talking to companies. I'm so surprised how plugged in Lynn is into the entire ecosystem. So 
the information is out there. If you're an entrepreneur, you got to be digging and you've got to be looking for it, but it's there. I actually have, if you don't mind, Karen, I have a question for my other panelists. Do you feel, is that okay, Karen? Of course. It's a discussion. Do, do you feel that there is a culture clash may be too big of a word, but a culture clash between the entrepreneurial culture and public public agencies, universities, and what would be considered more maybe risk averse or bureaucratic? And does that need to change in order for us to sort of advance quickly to meet the entrepreneurial needs of our industry? Steve, do you want to take your first crack at that one? Yeah, I'm giving it a lot of thought. Um, is, is there a culture clash? Um, I, I don't know if I would call it a culture clash. You know, um, I think that you, if, if you compare, and, and Allison's been in the U.S. as I have, you know, a lot of the, the entrepreneurs down there don't go after government funding. It's, A, a it's, it's not as, uh, as available in some sectors, um, but in agriculture and agri-food, we have a long-standing tradition of providing various forms of government funding. So um, I think there is a, um, um, a, a basic culture within, even within the entrepreneurs that we deal with that they'll go after the government money first um, you know, and they'll write proposals. And we've, we have dealt with companies who have been living off of government proposals for 10 years and they never had a single ounce of revenue. Um, and it's, you know, it, it is the nature of what we have in, in, in Canada, some, some respects. I, I do see it changing and I see it changing from the new entrepreneurs that are coming into agriculture who don't have that, that history of going after, you know, research funds. They, they get the NRC and that, that, I don't really include NRC in this so much, but a lot of the other forms of government funding that are available. Um, so uh, I, I think government has to play a role of a catalyst in helping to de-risk some of these things. And they do that through ourselves. We get government money and other incubators and accelerators. Um, so I, uh, I, I think it's positive. I think it's changing. So that was a very good question, Lynn. I, I, I was sitting here thinking while Dave was um, speaking about it, we've spent an awful lot of time talking about startup. Um, largely because Dave and myself, that's where we have a great interest. But um, I walked around with a chip on my shoulder for about 15 years because I could never get government funding, it seemed. I had to go out and make cash. So I built my first business from cash flow derived from operations. So um, Dave's comment about the US um, is, is a very good one. They do have a very good program in the US called SBIR or the Small Business Incentive where a company can get $150,000 roughly for the first look at their company. But if they perform well within the next year or so, they can get a follow on $750,000 grant, which is, which is really uh, quite amazing. We need that scale on or that follow on. Um, I'm a member of the Canadian Council of Innovators, and we are about 175 companies that have scaled at uh, rates beyond $10 million. So you had to have revenues in excess of $10 million or some, some IP or something that would have you there. These companies have an incredibly difficult time, and they are the ones that are creating the most number of jobs, perhaps. And the most number of inventions, Shopify is, is a member of CCI. We really need to think how we can do our mezzanine financing, our bridge financing. And I think it was Lori that mentioned, you know, food processing. That's a capital intensive business and they need to understand where they can get the money from, how can they accelerate growth. So we do have a gap and that gap exists in the large scale financing. And back to what Dave said about institutional investors, we've got to bring them back and be interested in investing in advancing our food processing, our value added processing. So um, yeah, we do have some gaps. Lori, any comments? So you know what, I don't. I think um, both Dave and Allison answered that question very well. So great question, Lynn, thank you. Yeah. 
You know, and going back to our theme, which is are there gaps? Um, I'll take a question from Mitchell Jap. So are there public good research topics such as agronomy and variety development that are lacking commercialization or are they appropriately managed now? So I guess that would be, a, are there sectors that we're missing in funding? I think my, my specialist team would say yes. Um, even um, if you're looking at apples, right? And apple varieties and the next variety, <clears throat> taking into account weather shifts and weather changes and the larger companies that can maybe buy club varieties that are, that are um, bred elsewhere um, in our whole breeding programs. But I would, I would agree that different, um, even from a perennia, I mean, it's in a 10 year old story now, but um, we, we helped the first commercial grower do sweet potatoes. We were told we were never going to be able to do sweet potatoes in Nova Scotia. And now we have a very large uh, sweet potato producer who's also thinking about doing a value added um, alcohol product because of his of what and people who it's so it was so warm in the in the Carolinas and they needed um, beet, they needed greens and they needed other so they're being grown in canning Nova Scotia now because it's too hot. So I think that development in different varieties, different vi uh, pest, pest um, resistant varieties and those types of things, and also that are looking at consumer, um, consumer trends and berries and antioxidants and raspberries have a short shelf life. Do we breed for those types of things in different varieties? I would say that we're probably lacking in that absolutely as, a, um, as an investment area. Karen, can I comment on that yeah, one? Yes, I was going to so, say, would you buy away from those types of investments? Yeah, um, you know, I think when it comes to sort of breeding and agronomy, uh, and again, I'm not an expert uh, with respect to this space, but uh, we've got a really good provincial government program called ADF. So a lot of, you know, a lot of work is done at that level. I think they've done a fantastic job in Saskatchewan uh, with respect to that. But one of the things I did notice, and again, this is micro because I'm talking about a specific example, but initially when we got involved with Verdiant Foods, one of the things that we realized pretty quickly was that we needed a high protein pea. Um, so what, what I found so fascinating was sort of when we had gone back to the researchers, there, there was a bit of a lack of communication there because I'm not sure that, that you know, they were aware of what the industry needed and it could have been more because it was a new industry too. Uh, they're on that now, they're doing a fantastic job, you know, that's being taken care of. But again, it's just that, that sort of, you know, industry communication on these are the needs. Like I don't, I think that we're missing a little bit in that regard too as well. Um, and like the problem, like from a private industry perspective, it's pretty hard to invest in, you know, varietal, varietal development, unless it's something specific, like, okay, we've got this company, they're big, they need a, a high protein P. But, you know, from a commercial perspective, like, again, I think it's more a public good, very important topic and something that we really, really need because it makes a difference too. Do you have any comments, Allison or Dave? Do you think this is an area you would shy away from? It all comes down to ROI, doesn't it? It, it does, but investors have longer horizons. And I was on a panel with Dr. Kirsten Beth this week, and she really, um, she really said something that was very intriguing to me, that she has the plant breeding laboratory in Saskatchewan has, uh, is probably the leading um, breeding laboratory for pulses. Now that really, anytime anyone tells me that we have a world leading uh, position or a stage, I get very excited as an investor. Now my time horizon is much longer. I'm looking at moonshot type investments. Everything I do seems to have a 20 year horizon. And to be honest, I think every, every uh, investment has a 20 year horizon. If you look at Apple, they were 20 years. And so I think there's, there's public good, but there's also uh, private opportunity. So it's just how we phrase that. And uh, I think as Canadians, we should be looking at those moonshots and that plant breeding where we really sit out as leaders. So I'm excited by it, but then um, perhaps maybe I'm not the best investor. One could say that. 
You know, I would like to take make one question more from our from our original questions because we've weaved our question from the audience in too. Um, but I, this is an interesting question. So through this pandemic, can we not talk about the pandemic? Food security has been a key issue. So how can investments in, in agri-food research and innovation help? Who would like to tackle that one first? Well, it's, it's, it's top of mind. Um, we, in, in our conversations with various government organizations, the things that come up are food security, immigrant labor force, food service industry that is basically locked out of consumer products because they don't know how to get after the consumer product industry. Um, and uh, a lot of the potential solutions we have today, we, we have solutions that in, in companies that could walk in tomorrow and, and help manage the COVID-19 issues in, in, uh, in slaughterhouses, for example. Um, but we need, we need to be able to to bring those to marketplace and to bring them to the investment community and to, and to show that these are workable solutions. Um, investors want it de-risked. So until it's in the Cargill plant and been proven, it's unlikely that, that someone's going to invest in that technology. Um, but once Cargill buys it, uh, you'll have an investor on, on your hands, right? Um, so we have been pushing the government to, to, to look at two things. One is, um, what are the technologies and opportunities to, to have a, a positive effect now on the, on the pandemic? But more importantly, how do we, post-pandemic, how do we make sure that we're beyond recovery mode and that we're running fast when we come out of it? So that we're not just turning a light switch on and starting off slowly again. You know, we have an opportunity to, to build the, the innovation and get the innovations into the marketplace right now. So that when the pandemic is finished, hopefully spring or summer, uh, with a, with a vaccine, um, our industry is up and running and and flying high rather than trying to do recovery. I would I would talk about a little bit from the um, from the horticulture side, um, in the sense that sort of indoor agriculture is seen as a bit of a niche right now. Um, but to me, um, we're doing like long cane raspberries to displace imports. We're doing like different production systems that allow us to take advantage of de-risking the, the, the weather um, issues that have to do with our, then I would say that, that would, there would be a huge investment required just in infrastructure for that. And when I say indoor, I mean undercover, hoop houses, greenhouses, um, lights, like the, it's a lot of infrastructure. And then you get into the whole question of energy costs. Um, but that would be, that's a huge mitigating, that would be a huge mitigating factor if, if any of our supply chains were disrupted. I think to agree with both um, Dave and, and also with you as well, Lynn, I think that um, recovery should not just be aimed at recovering losses, but positioning Canada for success in the global economy. And some of the ways that that's going to occur, I think, is uh, we are a trusted nation. And uh, I think that we can build on that fact. We can lead um, the global development of data trusts. I think that would help us um, automated cyber physical factories. We have to be focusing on how we can automate our factories. Um, our shift, if we take this shift, it will enable improved efficiency, sustainability, um, greater personalization of services. And I'm really keenly interested in that human machine interface, cobots to uh, help with agricultural production. And so what's get, this is gonna take is it's gonna take some investment. Um, we may see increased taxes, we may see increased regulation, we are now um, a country that has borders that are trading partners. We have over 90 of our trading uh, partners have closed their borders or they have new limits. And so if we can create trust and international collaboration coming out of the pandemic and create new methods of trade, I think that we will be much stronger and we cannot allow the pandemic to have more regulation on the other end of this because we don't know how to be resilient any other way. We have to be highly creative as we come through the pandemic. 
Any final thoughts, Lori? Uh, you know, definitely agree with everything my panelists uh, have talked about. I think, you know, I think everyone's kind of scared about what's to come. Um, margins are getting squeezed. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, having more automated factories. I think that's going to be critical for a lot of people. I was just talking to a food producer yesterday who has said, you know what? I said, what's, you know, what's going on? What about, how are things with COVID? Well, he goes, it's, it's been fine from, you know, other than some supply chain disruptions, he said, we handled that. But he said, now what's happening is he's losing employees, right? So you're getting an employee that is, is um, has been tested positive for COVID, your whole shift is gone, right? That whole, you know, so how do we, like you said, my margins are getting squeezed because I'm bringing people in overtime to cover for the people who are, you know, on being isolated. So I agree. Like, I think it's something that we have to like, really take a, a big step back and say, what have we learned from this? You know, where do we need to automate? Where, you know, like what other things do we look at? There's, I think there's a great marketing opportunity that we have right now from a sustainability aspect and a food security aspect. We have, you know, clean and safe agricultural products. And I think that's something that, you know, that's gonna help us in the future as we get through this. But again, I think we really all have to kind of just take a step back and go, it, it's probably gonna happen again. So what have we learned and how will we, how will we do this better? And if I can just chime in again from the from the horticulture side in terms of the mixture and the marriage between, you know, we had a we had a, uh, a question about varieties and about agronomy and commercialization of that in terms of if you want to automate and you want to automate in the horticulture space, you have to be looking at what varieties and production systems will will enable you to automate, right? Like there's certain crops that right now you can't have automated picking or you can't have automated weeding because you ruin the fruit, right? Or you and so we have to be looking at ways that it goes hand in glove with how that how that gets done, what varieties and what types of trees and how do we train the trees and how do we to be able to be picked or how do we not not hurt the potatoes if we do an automated picker and things like that. Like I think we need to look at those different they go hand in glove, the varieties and preparing them for automation. So we in our last what, 10 minutes, let's take some questions from the audience. And this is an intriguing question. So what are the characteristics of new ideas that best attract investments? Laurie, do you want to start? There you go. I'm unmuted. Um, so I would sort of turn that question around a little bit. Um, you know, ideas are very important, but what investors invest in is the people behind the ideas. And, you know, I think that's number one. Um, and that's why, you know, we get, uh, we take a long time uh, before we make investments. We do one to three a year. Um, you know, as I said, we really want to get to know the entrepreneur um, because it's a relationship. And you want to make sure that that you know like it's a relationship on both sides so the entrepreneur has to make sure that they've got the right investors and the investors have to make sure that they've got the right right uh, entrepreneurs in a way it's like a marriage you know if you're going to be with this person for quite a bit of time you're going to be there with this person in the ups and the downs and there's always downs i can tell you that there's usually ups too which is fantastic but you know again i would focus more on the individual behind the idea um Critical with, uh, so to get a good solid individual that's passionate, that has the three legs of the stool covered. We always talk about the three legs of the stool in terms of operational expertise, financial expertise, and marketing and sales expertise. We want to see the fact that individual doesn't have to have all three, but within their team. We want to see that they recognize that, okay, they've wrapped a team around them um, with what we say, people smarter than themselves. I think we all need to do that. Um, so again, when we look at sort of the, the people, that's number one. The second part of that is with respect to ideas, we want to see scalable ideas, um, you know, critical. We want to see the fact that, that it's, it's applicable. There's a problem and you're solving, solving a solution that consumers understand too. And I think sometimes with respect to more academic driven research, uh, it's just difficult sometimes for the researcher to, um, uh, to be able to sort of dummy things down for us investors, I guess you could say. So we need to really be able to understand what we're putting our money into and that it's scalable and has potential for high growth. 
Dave, any thoughts on the vest ideas? Um, I, I think Lori hit the nail on the head um, by talking about the, uh, the people first, uh, the business case, the business model, um, you know, the, the three stools, the three, three uh, parts of the stool. Um, I think one of the most difficult conversations that we have at BioEnterprise is when someone comes to us with what we think is a decent idea, but we know it's not going to go anywhere because the management team is, is sorely lacking. Um, there are researchers that can do this, but uh, most of the time, a uh, researcher's role is, is not that of a CEO. They don't typically have the skill sets that a CEO would have. So right away, we have to start talking to the, to the if it's a researcher in this case, uh, talking to them about how do we augment the team, um, but still protecting his or her, her position within that company. Uh, you know, the, the intent isn't to get rid of them. The intent is, ju is just to make them part of a bigger team so that you have the right people in place. Um, there is a, a, a company that, that we know pretty well, a venture capital company out of the US. Uh, they opened up an office in Canada and they hired a person in Canada uh, in the ag sector. And that was about four years ago. And to this day, they've never done a deal never done an investment. And we asked them why that was. And they said, because we can't find investable entrepreneurs. Now, they are out there. I'm sure Allison's seen them. I've seen them. But uh, in the, the, the perspective that they, that they have is that almost every deal they see, which is, may have great technology, doesn't have the investable team. Lynn or Allison? So I, I have a problem as an investor because I get excited about every, every deal that I see. I see potential in every founder. And uh, I will probably uh, be so fully invested by the end of this year because I'm seeing so many very good egg companies. But agree with Lori and Dave in that you have to have a coachable founder. I'm looking for massively scalable ideas. So I, I want to see something that can take an antiquated industry, and we've got a few of them around, but an antiquated industry, and that's a builder's focus, and turn it around. I'm also really interested, in, and this is why I became a strategic par or a venture partner at Builders, is I want a venture capital company that's invested in the founder and is really willing to assist an entrepreneur. And so we have a full team to coach entrepreneurs. And uh, like Dave, I've met a number of researchers that perhaps should not be entrepreneurs, but then I've met a couple that can be entrepreneurs and they're willing to do the work so that they can be. So I like coachable founders, massively scalable ideas. I really like honesty and integrity. And I think uh, also I'm looking at investments that have an ESG lens that we're actually not doing anything that's going to harm the environment, but actually moreover improve it. And I also have an equity and diversity index. So um, I, I, look at, um, I look at companies that have female founders um, because venture capital coming to female founders is almost non-existent. So those are some areas that I look at and um, I get up every day just overly excited because there's so many superb ideas out there. And I don't think I have anything to add. Like I have such brilliant panelists uh, with me, but I, I will say pull out two things that I think are great in, great in business no matter what you, what you feel. Is what Lori said, wrap, your, wrap smart people around you um, and then what, um, what Allison said, which is um, you need to be coachable. No godlike complexes. You don't know everything. You need, to, you need to be open. Can I ask in your last, our last one minute, can you, because there's some questions about how do you improve skills? Um, you know, how do you prepare people as entrepreneurs? Can you, can you make someone coachable? Can you grow an entrepreneur's skills in that area? I don't think you can make someone coachable. I think you have to be open. And if you're open, you can, you can help someone in many different ways. Not just I can help, but there's a whole team of 
of people across the country that could help entrepreneurs um, be better than what they are today. And I wish I had met, I had some fabulous mentors, but a great coach at scaling a business would have been a phenomenal help. Oh, Karen, you're on mute. <laughs> so now I owe Serge a big beer. <laughs> Before we end this conference, I just wanna thank all of you for participation. This was a really great panel. And all of you brought something really interesting to the table. So thank you so much for making this a great session. And I'm going to turn it back to Serge, who will remember to unmute himself. <laughs> I have unmuted myself, Karen. And yes, you do owe me a beer. I, I promised that uh, I told her that if she, she does it for a third time, she'll owe me a big beer, not just a beer, a big beer, whenever we're able to fly again and to meet again. I wanted to thank all the panelists for a fantastic session. All of you brought something different uh, from uh, uh, different parts of the country, but uh, absolutely fantastic um, discussions today. So I really appreciate uh, that. Our third session uh, uh, next week uh, will be on venture capital and banking, how they work and what they want. Um, a lot of you probably could uh, uh, be again panelists on that session, but we have different uh, panelists, but we do hope that you will participate uh, still. Uh, thank you very much for everyone. If we haven't gotten to your questions, um, uh, because I see we still have three there, uh, still, uh, we, we will try to send those to our panelists. And thank you again and have a great rest of the day. And we'll uh, hopefully see you uh, through this uh, me new medium on November 24th. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.